Good morning. My name is Maurice Crespi. I'm the managing partner of Schindler's Attorneys. Schindler's Attorneys is a co-founder of Cobra. Uh, it was founded together with IQ Business and Engage Business Turnaround. And the idea behind Cobra is to have as many partners hop on board uh, to provide assistance on a pro bono basis to companies, businesses in distress, uh, whether they're sole proprietors, spaza shops, or big business. Um, we do so by way of private Zoom meetings uh, with you and your team, um, or uh, uh, um, uh, we have a knowledge base on our website, uh, which is incredible and has been, we've been told is uh, the most in-depth and accurate database in the country. It deals with all the regulations and uh, uh, all aspects of the lockdown and the situation that we find ourselves in. What we also do as part and parcel of the pro bono services, we have these daily webinars. And the idea is to have guest speakers join us and to provide us insights uh, that can help us in our business um, and in our lives. And that's what we have today. Today, um, we have Dorian Will, who will be providing uh, some insight into how to deal with the situation, how to um, uh, 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 tackle uh, the issues that we that, that that have been arising these issues that are absolutely new to us and uh, uh, feelings and emotions that uh, we we haven't experienced before and uh, Dorian will be taking us through um, her insights into um, methods that one can employ to 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 ease the burden a bit about her uh, Dorian she's a clinical and organizational psychologist uh, her media and speaking career spans more than 30 years, hosting shows on Radio 702, um, SABC, uh, SABC3 Talk Print Media, and her Thrive with Dr. D podcast. She has offered keynote presentations to corporates and organizations in 57 countries on a variety of topics with personal development, couples, and families. Titles uh, include From Adversity uh, to Insights and Beyond, Intentional Relationships, The Healthy Family is Their Recipe for Success, Success Psyche, Emotional Intelligence, The Deciding Factors, and others. Currently, she's sought after, she's a sought after panelist and presenter on mental health and post-traumatic growth. So we're super, super lucky to have her on COBRA. And if there was any doubt um, as to uh, uh, who we have, we have a very, very important person. In Mandela's words, this is what she had to say about Dorian. I don't know if you're aware of the hope and inspiration you offer and the difference you make to so many lives. Dori, thank you for the great contribution you make to building our nation. And I'd like to mirror those words and thank you for being here today, for joining COBRA and to joining uh, the other panelists uh, who, who, who have joined us today. So before I hand over to you, Dorian, uh, let me introduce those panelists. We have Emma Marseille, from the IQ, uh, IQ business. We have Gary Barachovitz from Schindler's Attorneys, Renee Klopper from uh, IQ business, Adam Craker, the CEO of IQ business, and Paul Michael Keichel, he's a partner of mine at Schindler's Attorneys. Please ask questions. This is a webinar, that's the idea. Um, ask questions, they'll be addressed uh, probably towards the end, um, but post them on the Q&A, we'd be indebted to you. So thanks to you. Over to you, Dorian. Thank you very, very much, Maurice, for inviting me and for that introduction. You know, it's very special to be invited onto a webinar that is primarily geared for business and for business leaders, because most of the information and the content that you spoke about is to do with skills, to do with creative ways of pivoting. And when I think of that word, I always kind of get this image of demented ballerinas who are kind of turning around in a crazy way and because they have to sort of on the stage. You provide all kinds of information, legal support. Um, but I think, you know, when I think of this and what I'm doing here, there was a little book, it was a groundbreaking book many, many years ago. Dorian, um, I, I, I must ask, 
please can you turn on your video? Uh, we we want to uh, see you. I'm so sorry. Great, thanks. Hello. Hello, I hope you can see me now and hear me. Okay, so just to, to say that I'm delighted to be here because a statement was made many years ago in a little book called The One Minute Manager by Ken Blanchard that people who produce good results feel good about themselves. So what I'm doing here on a platform that is primarily geared to develop and to support businesses and business skills with skill and with knowledge and with information and with legal assistance and so on, is to say that there's a whole part that is beneath the iceberg. You can kind of learn these skills, you can, they can be available to you, but to integrate them and to use them and to make them meaningful, we have to go a little bit below the surface and to look at what all of this is doing to you underneath. And if you're not feeling okay, you're feeling completely stressed or overwhelmed or anxious or fearful or sad the ability to be able to latch on and use those skills productively will really be impaired. So I think it's, a, it's very good to be here and to take it onto a, just a little bit below the surface to most of what you've been doing on these webinars. And very often all the emails and the WhatsApps and the communication start by saying we're living in unprecedented, really uncertain, crazy times. And there are some people who have said, look, you know, and they want to do it in a reassuring way. It's not really unprecedented. We've had huge challenges before. Many of you have seen that little very powerful Simon Sinek uh, clip where he talks about having to reinvent yourself lots of times in our history. He talks about um, Starbucks. He talks about Uber. He talks about Airbnb talks about businesses that kind of suddenly weren't relevant anymore and had to reinvent themselves. But I do think that this is an unprecedented time for particular reasons. And the most, uh, the most prominent reason actually was highlighted to, to, to me, it's highlighted every day in the work that I do and the people that I speak to, but it was particularly highlighted towards the beginning um, of the lockdown, when I started working with frontline doctors and, and trying to prepare them for the onslaught that was probably going to befall them um, at, on an ongoing basis. And they were talking about the degree of absolute uncertainty and unpredictability and how that's affecting them and all of us. They say that when they walk through the doors of the hospital, they already were looking into each other's eyes. There was this connection and they kind of could pick up the fear that at that early stage, they weren't really even comfortable in talking about. They were doctors, right? They had to have all the answers. They'd been there before. These are challenges. It was their purpose. There was no alternative to winning. And so a lot of those feelings, and I'm going to talk about it, were really felt and kind of seen in a way, but not really said towards the beginning. But then they spoke about the fact, look, we don't know what the hell we're dealing with with this. We're learning and they're still learning, and we all are, about this virus every single day. We don't know how many people we're going to have to deal with. One started talking about 9-11 and said, you know, Dory, I was there at 9-11. And as traumatic as it was, and it was incredibly traumatic, after a while, we knew how many, we knew how long, we knew what we were dealing with. We knew that the actual physical trauma, never mind the, the psychological trauma, but was, was we, we could deal with it. We could, if necessary, get support from other people, and we were meeting with families. So what they're saying now, especially as it's developed, is that many of the doctors have to be in self-isolation or otherwise their families have to be um, to, um, removed from them. So they're not getting that family support, the hug from their child being filled up at the end of the day. They're using each other more as a kind of a support system. And something that I think a lot of people didn't think of, the families aren't there at the height of the illness, 
the people who are usually there to hold other people's hands, to see their family members through it, to kind of be there for them in a very, very strong way, often aren't there. And some of these doctors have to step up and almost take the place of those family members make all the calls and sometimes they say you know we're doing it for people who we haven't been treating over a period of time some of them are coming into icu we don't really know them or have that connection with them so the degree of uncertainty which is affecting us all in different ways is the is a springboard for a lot of emotions that are manifesting. People can kind of cope with things better if they knew what they were dealing with when it was going to come to an end. So it's kind of precipitated a kind of a state in a way of we talk, we've spoken about global warming for many, for a long time. We now talk to an extent of global mourning that we've lost the world as we knew it. We kind of in a very turbulent sea. We don't see the new world as it's going to be. We can kind of visualize it. But what we are recognizing is it's not a sprint with 21 days of lockdown. We know that we're in for a marathon. We don't know how long the marathon is. And that's the part that is so disconcerting. And this brings rise to just so many feelings that I'm going to talk about. But just to mention that kind of mourning, there's a grief cycle. Many of you have heard about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who is a very well-known writer about dealing with grief. And traditionally, well, she speaks about five stages of grief. There's a sixth one that was kind of introduced and very important to us by one of her colleagues, and it was actually introduced after she died, and it was one called meaning. But if we look at what she was talking about, what she was saying that initially there's denial, and if you remember, there was a lot of denial. Oh, come on, it's not so bad, you're overreacting, this is just flu, we've been there before. There was, I mean, she talks about bargaining, and that's a very personal thing, you know, who you talk to yourself, the promises you make to yourself, or you make to a bigger picture, please, you know, if, if we can just get out of this, I will make sure that I'm a better husband, better partner, treat people better, all those promises that you make to yourself, which happens more on an individual basis. And then, of course, there's sadness as one begins to realize the extent and the new enormity of what we're doing. And there's anger. Anger often is felt when you're out of control and you don't know what to do, especially when you're used to being in positions where you can, can take control and you're supposed to know what to do. And then you kind of act it out when you feel literally at sea and you don't know what to do. So there's sadness and anger. And I think that at this stage down the line, quite a way down the line now, we, it, we in that stage, all the other feelings still exist, but we in that stage of, okay, we have to come to terms with this. And that's part of the role that COBRA is playing, coming to terms with it and taking control again in a different way. And that stage is called the st um, acceptance, where we know that this is here to stay and we are coming to terms with it. So the emotions that come up, of sadness, of fear, of anxiety, and of stress, actually are normal reactions to the most difficult and unprecedented and uncertain situation. If you weren't feeling them, you probably would be either not a member of the human race or in that early denial stage. So there are normal reactions. Is that supposed to help? Well, to an extent, and what has happened is that from my point of view and from all of our point of view, we're recognizing that there's a mental health pandemic as well as a health pandemic. And, the, and, and what it's done as well is it's destigmatized to quite a large extent mental health. There's never been so much talk ever on public platforms or between people about, in inverted commas, mental health. There's kind of permission to do it because to an extent we all in this together, if a virus doesn't discriminate, as we hear many times, people say we're all in the same boat. I don't think we're in the same boat. I think we're in the same storm. 
it's affecting us all very differently. The boats, particularly in South Africa, are very different boats that we have to be on, on this turbulent sea. But there is, so I guess, in some ways, a very good thing, a permission to say, look, I'm not really coping with this too well. How are you doing? Or I have moments of anxiety that perhaps last longer than moments. Or honestly, I really get scared or I feel out of control. It's given a little bit more permission to talk about the ways that we are coping or not coping and what we're going through from an emotional and psychological perspective. Permission that was kind of stigmatized before and labeled as being weak or you're not allowed to talk like that, or you're a leader, right? You know, you're the one who's meant to set the example emotionally. And so I think from that point of view, there's been some kind of positive effect that has resulted in a connection. So having said that, if these feelings are normal, I just must say there's a lot of need. People are talking about things even like an increased suicide rate. I haven't seen any South African statistics that um, that are, are highlighting that, but you know that's how people are talking globally. Of course, we do know for sure that there's been an increase um, in the divorce rate, and people who were prone to certain kinds of mental illness before have actually developed them um, in a in a stronger way. So things like depression or anxiety this time has kind of served as an incubator, a kind of magnifying glass. If you were anxious before, it's likely that maybe you started panicking and maybe haven't been able to control it. When, if you were perhaps the kind of person who just dismissed things and were in denial, you might find that that's kind of catching up on you. And that kind of incubator doesn't only work on a personal basis, with your own feelings. If you're in lockdown, I mean, we say for better, for worse, but not for lunch, you know, with um, your partner, and there were very difficult, there were difficult unsaid issues before. There was an elephant in the room that hasn't been undressed, sometimes a herd of elephants, such that you can't even see the space between you because it's so dirty. In the beginning, I was thinking, my goodness, what an unbelievable opportunity to sit and deal with these things in a quiet way with time and to kind of face them and clear the air and resolve conflict. But the thing is that it is that. And people have found that and they have used it for that. But I've also seen, and I'm talking against myself, instead of saying, do it, do it, I've also seen some of the danger of doing it. People who don't have the skills or the real empathic ability to listen some of these things have become blown out of proportion. And on occasion, it has to be evaluated to say, okay, look, we've just got to deal with this, find other ways, distracting ways, personal ways, suck it up to such time as you can have a third person there or help. So when do you ask for help, having said that these feelings are normal? There are two main guidelines. One is extent and the other is duration. If you're going through a huge amount of anxiety or fear, such that you can't cope, either in the work that you are attempting to do, or in your relationships, you are unable to focus, you almost feel that you are disconnected from the environment around you, and this feeling lasts for some time, I would say even as short as going on for two days and into the third day, you might have to stop and take stock and say, this is the time we are reach out to a lot of the, the assistance that is available. And a lot of that has interestingly ju um, just popped up. Your organization, other organizations that off offer a psychological support, people have recognized the need. So there is a lot of assistance out there. But how do you actually deal with the feelings? Even if I say they're normal reactions, it doesn't mean that you've just got to accept that they're normal reactions. One of the ways is actually counterintuitive, most especially for this group that I, that you, who I am with today, because I know a lot of you are used to behaving and feeling in a completely different way. You feel in control, you've got plans of action, you know what to do. You have taken a hell of a knock that has generated 
this kind of fear, uncertainty, huge stress and anxiety. And the usual way that you want to deal with them, the usual way is, oh, for goodness sake, don't be weak. Let's douse it down. It's going to be better in the morning. Shove it under the carpet and move on. And what has happened as a result of that with many leaders is that your emotional carpet starts looking like the Alps after a while. You cannot believe what it looks like. And if you continue to do it, these feelings will be heard. They are going to knock at your emotional door, your physical, um, your physical door, and they're going to manifest in ways that you are not going to like. So what we know with these kind of feelings, and for you, as I say, it's not often the usual way, is that actually they demand to be recognized. And instead of shoving away, you actually have to lean into them and name them. And we know if you name it, you can begin to tame it. If you feel it, you can begin to heal it. And there's a physiological basis for that as well. And just going into it very briefly, the emotions cause reactions. They cause things like catastrophizing, where your head is like a runaway train. What if this? What if that? You see yourself into the future. And that's very interesting because there's an, a tendency for negative bias with that. That primitive brain was designed to eat or be eaten. It was designed to protect yourself. And so usually the negative thoughts are almost like Velcro and the positive thoughts are almost like Teflon. And so we have a bias when we, obviously when we catastrophize or ruminate to think of the worst and we get out of the present, right out of the present and into the future with imagination of things that you can't even imagine that haven't even begun to happen yet. So what has to happen, of course, is to be able to find ways to bring yourself into the present and to say, stop, see a big red stop sign. Your mother or your grandmother used to say, now, just take a breath and count to 10. They didn't realize that what that does is it helps you physiologically because when you do that and you stop, you move from your primitive brain, which is the amygdala, to the thinking brain, the adult brain, where you can think, the neocortex. And so instead of this reaction that you have, you are able to start responding. And what responding means is that you are able to see the gap, a little gap between the stimulus and response. And in the gap, you can think. And in the gap, you can make choices. And in the gap, you can get yourself out of that kind of runaway train mode and back into reality. So you can say, hang on, hang on, calm down. What would I tell a friend if they were in this situation? What are the facts? How can I look at myself from the outside in and say, right, you know, this is getting out of control. Let's stop. So the thing that I'm saying is that if you don't own the story, by doing that initially, the story is going to really own you. And so you have to get into that kind of, of, of brain as a start. And then one of the other things that helps a lot that people aren't used to doing, you know, we, we are often in businesses and in leadership positions, we kind of primed to take care of other people and to look after them and our own needs come last. And I often think when I talk about this, you know, what they say on every flight you've ever been on, put your oxygen mask on first before you help other people or children. And that's what we need to do now. If we don't practice self-compassion or take care of ourselves, you have to look after your employee's employer. You have to look after your colleague's colleague. You have to look after your wife's husband or you have to look after your children's father. When you start framing it like that, you see the importance for other people as well as for you. Not that you need an excuse of taking care of yourself. So how does that manifest? I don't have to go into all of this from a routine physical point of view. It's all over every news on those health tips. 
the importance of having some sort of routine that is kind of predictable. Because when I talk about grief and loss, we've lost so much. We've lost predictability. We've lost money. We've lost jobs. We've lost physical contact. We've lost that kind of feeling, the X factor that we feel when there is a hug. We've lost that connection, even in places of worship, around the kind of dining room table that we used to just take for granted. There have been so many losses which has generated these feelings along the grief cycle that I've been talking about. So to take care of yourself and cut yourself some slack, I did a television breakfast show the other day, and I think I just, the poor presenter, just, you know, looked at me as if, you know, this woman is mad, because what they wanted to talk about is they said, what do we do at the 3 p.m. slump that tends to happen every day? And I looked at her and I said, slump? She said, yes, slump. What do you do when there's the slump? I said, no, I mean it. You slump. And so what you do is you know that's going to be your downtime of the day. So plan in for it. You can stop if meditation helps, which we know that it does. I had a discussion with Maurice about that yesterday, and he tells me that's what he does. I have discovered something that I didn't, I promise you, I didn't know. I'm very fortunate in the house that I live in. There's a beautiful patio, and I've lived in that house for a very long time. Do you know I've never seen that patio ever like that in the winter sun, ever? I've seen it when I entertain. The flowers have to be right. I choose the wine. I say, what is the, what, is the food going to be ready? It's always been about seeing that it's nice for other people. And I've discovered that there's this kind of magic thing called winter sun. Winter wasn't for sun. And I was always on the go and going here and then, whatever. Still being a bee, we all are busy in a different way. But to take time out and sit there. And look at this place that I've always had. It's been a very long time, but never seen before. Has been amazing. And you find ways, whether it's Netflix, whether it's reading, whether it's the ability to have kind of clean to time for yourself without feeling guilty. Because sometimes on top of all of these feelings, there's shame. I should be working harder. I should be coping better. I'm not good enough. Why can't I deal with this? So on top of the feelings, there's like a double whammy of shame that comes to it as well, where you judge yourself. And, I, and, and it's really important to do the things they tell you about in terms of sleep, lots and lots and lots of research that's been published about the importance of sleep and what that does for your immune system. I talk about at least seven hours of sleep every day. I've still got to really listen to that advice. The importance of exercise and how you can either spread it out or how you need to do it. These things aren't only important physically. They look after your mental health as well, as does nutrition and giving yourself some time out. And the other thing that's incredibly important and really deals with this feeling of shame or not being good enough, in just an amazing way, some of you often quote her because I think that she is amazing as a writer and a researcher and a theorist, is Brené Brown, who talks about the power of vulnerability and is a shame researcher. And she says that empathy, that kind of empathic connection, is like kryptonite to shame. You can't experience empathy from another person and shame at the same time. Because what empathy does is acknowledge the feelings of the other person. Clearly, you don't give advice. It's not in a judgmental way. You listen to understand. You don't listen to respond which is a big difference. You're not thinking in your head, what am I going to say next? You're not becoming an echo chamber where you're going to say my situation is much worse than your situation or just increase it. You are listen, listening, fully present, in the moment, with all of your senses receptive to the other person in a way to understand what they are going through. And then you tell them, I've heard that you're really stressed. This is a tough time. you concerned. I'm talking for myself. You know, and this is another thing that I'll tell you about comparative shame. Yes, it's very sad that your son, you know, who has worked for four years and who is unable to graduate, 
with his degree because of this. Now, some people feel very guilty about saying what they are going through or even being understood in terms of what they're going through because they say things like, look, there are street children who have no homes. It's the starving children in India thing. How can I, in a relatively privileged position where there is food on my plate at least, you know, feel bad about what I'm going through? And this whole thing, um, which is nice for you to hear, it's called comparative suffering. And comparative suffering never served anyone. What it's like is we're saying that compassion is almost like the, uh, uh, is a finite thing. There are eight slices of the pizza. If I take three for me, there are only five left for you. It doesn't work like that. Compassion is an infinite thing. And if you recognize, practice self-compassion or show compassion to a colleague or a friend or you're there for them, such that you say, listen, I'm your person. I understand and this, there is science behind the healing power of support. We all turn around and say, you know, don't just sit there, do something. But we under, may underestimate the importance of, look, sometimes when you can't do something, just be there. Just sit there. Sit there with me. Understand what I'm going through. Don't make me feel judged or weak or stupid or incompetent or whatever. By acknowledging my feelings, you're acknowledging me. And that word acknowledgement is so important now. It's been important for, for what's been happening in the United States with race. Just the power of being acknowledged. It's important for what you are going through in your businesses with you and with your teams. Be heard in a non-judgmental way. And at least that overlay of shame is helped a bit. And you begin to find your tribe. So I'm not saying spill out to every single person that you meet. You'll find your tribe in terms of those people who you can connect with. And if I go back to the doctors, the doctors saying are saying that they're using each other in a way that is much more than, um, than they used to before, that, that the doctors are becoming the, their tribe and they're sharing more than they did um, before. So it's a support system, it's empathic support, and it's a tribe. So the last thing that I want to say on this is that there's a difference between, we always hear, be positive, be positive, be positive, stay positive. You hear that probably many times in a day. And I want to say that there's a difference between positivity and mindful optimism or realistic optimism. In the beginning of this lockdown, we have, were getting all of those emails about the dolphins swimming in the canals of Venice and the skies never be bluer. And while there was a lot of truth in that, and maybe the world is going to be a better place, I was often feeling that it was too soon for people to hear. What it was saying is don't talk about what you're going through. Deny the trauma. Just be positive. Don't talk like that. We're going to get out of it and we're probably going to get out of it tomorrow. So it was too early where people really hadn't acknowledged what they were going through enough. But now, and this was the sixth stage that I was talking about before, David Kessler, who used to work with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, approached the Kubler-Ross Foundation and her family after the loss of his own son, who was 21 years old and said, we need another stage to the cycle. I want to call it meaning. How do you find meaning in all of this that comes out of acceptance? And he also cautioned about finding meaning too soon. When you've lost somebody, you know, I've lo I lost a husband some years ago. Also, it's acted as an incubator. I think that I've done fairly well, but I feel it very much now, because like when I end this call, right now today, and I press leave meeting, you know, I kind of look around, there's no one here who says to me, how did it go? Or I know you were anxious, did it go well? So the losses that people are feeling, you might feel more now, I know that I do, whatever. So he talks about the importance of finding meaning, but he says the meaning reveals itself. And the meaning of this is beginning and is revealing itself. And just to address from, you know, instead of developing post-traumatic stress, 
which comes PTSD, which comes out of not recognizing and dealing with the journey, there is also the possibility of post-traumatic growth, very much. There's, there are people are talking about priority shifts, very much. You stop, take stock, re-examine your goals. Where are you going? Where have you been? How do you spend your energy from now on? What are your priorities? And often people are talking about the importance of relationships with tremendous gratitude for people who'd always been there, but they're seeing differently now, for the support that they're getting, for the circumstances that they're in, but mainly relationships. And there was a little bit of interesting research that happened over 9-11 about that where the researchers phoned all the families who had lost someone. And they asked these families, did you receive a phone call? And many of them, of course, with the aid of modern technology, said we did. And then the researchers said, well, what did your loved one say? And every single one said exactly the same thing. Everyone. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know. Now, we don't have to go around as if it's our last day and say, I love you, I love you, I love you all the time. But people are saying it more. They're appreciating each other more. They're saying about the characteristics and the behaviors about other people that they are recognizing. We're having more of what we call COVID conversations. They're more vulnerable. They're more in-depth. Sometimes they're longer. Sometimes that's a good thing, that's a bad thing. It's also important to phone up and say, look, just thinking of you, hello, how are you? Without saying, no, I can't phone, I can't phone because we need an hour or a marathon. But people are talking more like that and expressing a new kind of gratitude and priority that they're really feeling. They also have more humility about the balance of what is and what isn't in your control. There were so many statements that I used to say in all the talks that I was doing. 95% of what happens to people is like fate or circumstance. Take care of the 5%. Take care of the 95%. Uh, the 5 sorry, 95%. 5% is like fate or circumstance. The 95% is under your control. So the statement was you take care of the 95%. Be in the driver's seat of your life. The rest will take care of itself. Well, we know that things can happen. Life happens in an unprecedented way. We know that we are absolutely not in control of a lot of things. It helps us decide how we respond, what we are in control with and what we're not. And this kind of humility gets a balance between taking responsibility, in other words, the ability to respond, and then what people on a more spiritual level say, surrendering to the process. Is there a bigger partner? Sometimes it's a religious affiliation. It doesn't matter what you call it. But it's, not, it's the knowledge that it's not all completely up to you. A lot of it is. Some of it isn't. And boy, have we really, really learned these lessons. It's also made us more feeling more of a member of the human race, more connected to other people. The fact that organizations like you and others have stepped up and saying, look, what can I offer? It might be money, it might be services, it might be information, it might be a conversation, it might be a helping hand. But we're seeing that you know, all over the world and here, there's nothing that joins people more than a shared emotional event. And that works for a couple, it works for a company. You go through something in your company that's challenging. And provided the communication and everything was good and there was a good internal morale, they will come together like this for you. And get connected. We've seen it so often, you know, over occasions like the transition or winning the World Cup, that kind of feeling of pride. So it, it works on a positive way and it works on a negative way to connect people. And so we are feeling more connected and more responsible members of the human race. It teaches us patience because whatever you do, you are learning about skills, entrepreneurship, people are offering you things. Sometimes you do what you can to accelerate the process and sometimes it's a waiting game. And maybe you learn a lot while you're waiting. And then the last thing is just there's a question, a big question too. People used to always say before, we don't say it so much anymore, face reality, face reality, face reality. Kind of, we don't even know what face reality is or what reality is anymore. It's really thrown. 
And, you know, I just when, when I, I was talking about positivity, when I talk about what realistic optimism is, it is the belief that this too shall pass. We don't know when. And it's hanging on, you know, Freud, who was the father of psychology, used to say that there are three important things that healthy people exhibit. They all have someone to love, which doesn't mean a life's partner. It means someone who you know that you can contact to help you out of a difficult situation if you have to, even if it's just one person. Something to do, some sort of purpose in life. What is your purpose and why are you getting up in the morning? doesn't have to be work, but it can be. But the last thing he said is something to look forward to, a belief, some sort of optimistic belief that there is light at the end of the tunnel that aren't always the lights of an oncoming train. So people are believing that this too shall pass. We don't know when. And that can often be the difference that makes the difference in your journey. Are you going to cope with the journey or are you not going to cope with the journey? And there are people, people in our country. I used to meet with Ahmed Kathrada sometimes. Great, great privilege to meet with these people. And he used to say to me, you know, Dory, we were still fighting the struggle. It was just from another side. The cause never went away. It was just from a different place. Viktor Frankl, who I had the privilege years and years and years ago, when he was in South Africa and doing a big talk, he kind of addressed all these people. He looked at them and I thought, OMG, the man's forgotten his opening lines because I was a new speaker and I was nervous. And then he just surveyed everybody and then he started to talk and he said, you know, the reason that I survived the concentration camps was you. I've never seen you before. I've never even met you before. But in my dreams, I've said these words a thousand times. So he went on to talk about keeping that alive, the belief that he has to tell the story. No one could take that away from him. It was that, that optimism that is characteristic, of, but realistic, mindful, not blind positivity or don't talk like that or think positive or whatever. And so just to say face reality, we don't even really know what the reality is. But we're able to kind of, and that's what you're all doing, this word again, pivot, create, think out of the box, make a reality a little bit different for you. And, ju and there was that wonderful story of someone who did just that. It's that Pullman, the famous violinist. It's a famous story of how when he was giving a concert, he was struck with polio when he was a child. And people knew how he would come onto the stage. He had, he had very loyal followers, and it was always very slowly. He had calipers on his legs. So he would take his seat in front of the orchestra, undo the calipers on his right leg, physically pick up the leg, put it over his left, bend down, pick up the violin, nod at the conductor, and start to play. And this is exactly what happened at this particular concert. At the Avery Center, Lincoln Auditorium, New York City, he went through the whole ritual and he picked up the violin, put it under his chin and nodded at the conductor. But a few bars into this amazing violin symphony, they heard a bang like this. At first, the audience say that they thought it was a gunshot. They didn't know what was going on and then they quickly realized that one of the strings on his violin had broken, snapped and broken. And then there's this collective breath, you know, and this pregnant silence. Okay, what's he going to do? Is he going to go off again? Will someone bring him a new in, uh, instrument? Is he going to stop the concert? Because actually that was reality. You know, they knew. Everyone knew. That whole audience knew. The conductor certainly knew. You cannot play the violin with three strings. It's not possible. But you see, at that minute, it's like Pullman refused to know that. So he just looked at the conductor and nodded again. And the conductor shrugged his shoulders and he looked at him very deliberately, straight through his eyes, as if to say, you play, I want to do this. And so they started with the piece again. And what happened was absolutely mesmerizing. He modulated it, he made that instrument, he had to recompose the piece. He made it reach sounds that they had never heard of before because it wasn't in reality. And they were witnessing something that was out of the realm of imagination. 
and they were brought together because it was a shared emotional event. And at the end of this absolutely incredibly powerful witnessing and sharing experience, that audience got up as if they were one person. And they applauded and applauded and applauded and applauded. And then they, he held the bow up to silence them. And he did what he had never done before. He spoke to them. And he said, you know, he said, in life, it's up to the artist to play whatever you have, you, you, what, play with whatever you can, whatever you have. And sometimes it's up to the artist to play with what you have left. And that got written about a lot. And people started saying, well, what's my music? Is my music still inside me? I will not leave this earth or give up with my own music still inside you. And that's what we've asked to do now. Find different songs, play differently, but access the music that is still inside us, individually and collectively. Rihanna, Thank just you. to let you know, we have 15 minutes. You asked that I let you know. Thank you for letting me know. I'm, I'm very happy to take questions. People okay. have it. Yeah, so we have some over here. We have... Um, one from Adam, any specific advice on steps we should take with our children and young adults as they react to the unfolding situation? Our children are either just starting university or reaching the end of high school. Their perspective and experience in the education system has completely changed as a result of lockdown. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, it's obviously something that so many of us have to challenge. And, you know, there's kind of, mainstream advice and there's also specific advice because the situation is so different. The mainstream advice isn't that different really from some of the suggestions that I've spoken about of how to deal with ourselves and how to support each other but let's talk about it from the point of view of parents. The first thing is try and keep the lines of communication open as much as possible without judgment and acknowledge what they're going through. So it is tough. It's different. You're having to learn in ways that you didn't know about before. You know, um, it's, it, you, uh, you might be anxious sometimes. You know, you, you, you wouldn't necessarily want to put words in their mouth, but you can ask them. And if you're lucky enough with teenagers for them to tell you, because they quite often will say, no, it's fine, or I'm okay or, you know, kind of be fairly dismissive. And sometimes they talk with their actions as much as they talk with their words. So if you see that they're becoming more withdrawn or more aggressive, you can act out or act in, you know, either being withdrawn or aggressive. You might want to try and interpret that behavior as, you know, you're unsure, you, can, you see that you're having a hard time. Sometimes they'll tell you. And it's not don't think about it, you know, it's, just to be able to say, acknowledge this is what your difficulty is. And that's the first step. After that, saying what do you think would help? This is the situation we're in. Sometimes what they're asking is for your availability. You know, will you sit down and, and do this with me? Sometimes people find that quite connecting. But I think the important thing is just, and you can also say, you know, this is new for me as well. If you show your own uncertainty sometimes and vulnerability, it gives them permission to do that. Look, we're in this together. As a family, we're kind of making it up as we go along. You have your challenges, you know. Certainly, I have mine. Let's kind of address this, acknowledge that it's difficult, and see how we can, how we can make it work in a better way. Thanks for that. Um... We have a, another, um, we had Pepper Maria on yesterday and uh, Adam asks, Pepper Maria from Joe Public said yesterday, purpose is no longer a differentiator, actions are. Would you agree? Look, I think that there's kind of, you know, I mentioned him in the beginning because I think that he's good and puts things across in a very clear way. I mentioned someone who, I'm, you know, I mentioned Simon Sinek. He always talks about the why. He says that a lot of businesses talk about the how and the what and the how we do things and that. But your common thing is why we're in existence. 
you know, why are, what is this business there to exist? Who is our market? Not only who is our market, what, what is our desired outcome? for kind of having this purpose. So then, and the purpose really is the why. And I mean, I found that very, very strongly when I dealt with the doctors, they almost expressed it. Me, most of them weren't saying that they're redefining their purpose. They're saying that they have to find different ways of executing their purpose and of manifesting their purpose and recognizing that the journey along the way isn't the same journey, but their purpose was just under, there was no alternative in the ones that I spoke to. Is that true of businesses? I think sometimes, most of, you know, you if you can repurpose in a way that is an exciting new purpose that people are buying into, and that instead of sticking to the old purpose in the same way, you know, there's always that saying, if you do things in the set, you, the, the old way, just bring our old results. You have to, in some ways, repurpose. So I think it requires a big question with you, with the team that you were with, of starting like that. You know, is our raison d'etre and our purpose the same? Do we have to reinvent the journey along the way? Or can we see a different purpose? So if you talk about, um, say, Starbucks and the coffee shop, the purpose still was to provide people with a wonderful experience and the best coffee that they can get and a different kind of environment. You can say part of the purpose was the same. We're doing it differently. But if you see many of the businesses that are reinventing themselves now, people that were making women's high heel shoes are making PPE clothing. They're still manufacturing, perhaps out of wear, but they're responding to a new market and to a need. Some of it for, for assistance and some of it for profit. There's a need, obviously, for masks, for gloves, for sanitizers that wasn't there before. Were we a business that made other kinds of chemicals? Do we have to have a same purpose differently or a different purpose collectively that's relevant? So... And I know you can answer that question, you know, certainly better than I can, but that's some of the thoughts I have. But I do think you have to keep re-looking at that and not doggedly doing the same thing, expecting a different outcome over and over again. We have started asking our cures at IQ Business to go deeper in their connection with each other. A simple question, how are you, is now followed by how are you really? It is surprising what comes back when one asks, really? I often feel unprepared to deal with what is expressed, although I feel this is making a deeper connection with our team. Any advice on our approach would be appreciated. Yeah, well, the first thing I'd like to say is just, you know, congratulations to you for doing it. Because we started off by saying, honestly, you know, if, you know, if you feel that kind of connection, and a good internal morale and a support system and an understanding of, look, we're all having individual and collective journeys. And you create a platform to hear that and offer each other that kind of support. You couldn't do anything. From my perspective, obviously, that's a better start or better springboard. Why does how are you not work and how are you really works? Because we say how are you all the time. We've been saying it forever, and what it means is it's just a trite statement of connection. There have been times, especially after losses or devastation, you know, where I've heard people or I might have wanted to say it myself, look, how the hell do you think I really am? If I told you, you know, I was fine and fighting fit after a very big challenge, a financial challenge or a devastating loss, you might want to certify me because that's a crazy reaction to a situation. Grief is the price you pay for love. And we're all going through different kinds of things and different feelings. So, you know, if you say I'm just fine, usually it's just a connector and it's not even a real connector. It's a kind of dismissive connector. So how are you really, I think, absolutely does take it on another level or begin to take it on another level because the person picks up your intention. The intention is I really want to know how you are. 
how are you really? But even more important is I really am interested and want to know. If I didn't want to know, I'd just say, how are you? It's an easier conversation. Say fine and move on without the ability to understand and connect. When you start having those conversations with real listening, where you hear, you listen with your heart, not only with your ears. You read between the lines. So you can say, I can see that this is a tough time. Or you're feeling that it's a particular challenge right now. Or things aren't working as the way they used to. You know, people will start opening up to you. And that's how you get authentic connection. Vulnerability is very important for authentic connection instead of superficial connection. So I think it's great that you're recognizing that. And I know that Adam, you know, as he's, he's had a lot of experience with that because he's been in particular groups, you know, that are called forum whose purpose is to develop that kind of trust and openness and vulnerability such that we can be there, hear the real stories, offer each other a slice of ourselves, shared experiences and support. Look, this is what helped me. I'm not saying you must, you should, you have to, but let me tell you a little story. I found that it was important to make my own time in the day. You know, I found that if I cleared the air in my head, or the space between me and my wife, I was sleeping better at night. So experiences and ways of coping that you've had, you'll only be able to share with each other if you develop that certain amount of trust and connection. And how are you really, I think, is a, re is a really good opening question for that. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, we are almost out of time, Dorian. I just want to mention to our viewers uh, that there's a course that I did and I've recommended to my staff to do. And those who have done it um, have found the benefits to be immeasurable. It's a course by Yale University. I came across it um, uh, in Forbes magazine. Uh, it's the most popular course uh, at, at, at Yale. It's offered for free on Coursera. It's called The Science of Wellbeing, and it's by Laurie Santos. Um, the reason I'm mentioning it is because I really, really, really uh, uh, would recommend to my viewers that to start the course. It's for free. There's a reason why everybody's uh, raving about it. And much of what Dorian um, has said today is actually mirrored in the course and uh, the scientific basis uh, for what's being said today uh, uh, is, is revealed. And an interesting aspect of the course, it deals with our misconceptions on happiness. But just to conclude, I want to make a point, and maybe you can comment on it. Um, uh, the, 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 the message is that happiness uh, is found through kindness, community, and experience. And if you think about it, those three elements are lost during lockdown. How, who are you kind to? It's difficult to be kind. You don't have the sense of community. And what experience do you have? You, you, you're in lockdown. So, Maurice, you know, um, I felt that even after our conversation yesterday, which was lovely, it was a good connecting conversation. So, you know, I feel comfortable enough with you to say that I partly agree with you, that we don't have that, but I also think that we've had it in a way even more. This kindness in terms of help and how people have stepped up, they're saying to me that they feel filled up because of the kindness and the services and the work. Some are just, you know, doing, it, it doesn't matter how much. And that the kindness starts in a way that because people are more mindful of the power of it, that we didn't recognize enough before, like in your own home, people that you work with just being aware how you talk to them, how much you know about them, you know, how you treat them, but even bigger kindness. And people are saying something very interesting. They're saying that the line between giving and receiving is becoming very blurred because when I give, I receive, you know, I mean, you guys are doing that now, you know, on this kind of platform, you get that kind of feeling of I mean something to someone else 
or I'm a valuable person. I'm of value because someone is finding either me as a person. It's acknowledgement again. It's a, that recognition, not to say we've got to be recognition junkies, but it's Ubuntu. It's real Ubuntu. Ubuntu means interdependence. I am who I am because I and and I affect you and you you and you know what I mean. You know the whole thing. You're so absolutely right. You, I, I, I withdraw my submission. You, you're so okay. right. If you if you actually think about it, we are experiencing kindness. So there's the experience. There is kindness, and it's in the community. So it's yeah. actually the complete antithesis to what to to what I just said. So we we do agree. Good, please. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us today. You've been fantastic. Very, very, very special to have you on the show. We will get you back, promise. Thanks to my panelists. Thanks to um, the attendees and to the audience. Thanks for attending today. And please be mindful. Thanks, guys. Thanks all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.